Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ancient Missouri Props and Costumes. I'm Donald Barco, and today I'd like to wish you a happy Assyrian New Year. This year we're celebrating 6,772 years. Let's get started. Today we'll be talking about ancient Assyrian scale armor. We'll be talking about ancient Assyrian helmets. As you can see, this particular costume I'm spotting a short tunic with stockings. As you can see here, boots, wristlets, armlets, headband and my broad belt is my sword with my sword strap and my narrow belt which locks in to make it into a baldric system now this is the costume that i wore for the ancient assyrian soldiers outfit at the assyrian new year's festival this year at fairfield showground and on top of this was the new scale armor that I had made in the style of Sennacherib's reliefs which is a bodice of scale armor sleeveless with a skirt that's attached to the bottom of it in a leatherette style and a fringed border on the curve which is on the right leg and on the straight which is on the left leg and I'll be showing that to you later so now let's get in to learning a bit more about ancient Assyria and our scale armor in my research when I started looking more and more into the ancient Assyrian uh, scales what I found was they tended to be grouped in systems that had a certain amount of holes and this is evident in theses such as uh, Hewlett's ancient Near Eastern armor from the Bronze Age from the late Bronze Age and he had grouped the scales in or categorized the scales into uh, a numbered hole system so for example if there was six holes on the scale that would be equivalent to a six hole system five holes a five hole system seven a seven hole system However, regarding the ancient Assyrian scales, I delved into it a bit deeper and found that those categories are not helping in, in regards to stitching the armor together. In fact, what was more relevant was focusing on the bottom half of the scale. So below the midrib, you will always see at least one or two holes below the midrib. So in this case, I'm giving you examples of scales, ancient Assyrian scales that have a two hole system meaning that they have two holes below the midrib as well as the horizontals beside the midrib and above the midrib on this side is an example of Assyrian scales that were found to have only one hole so below the midrib Sometimes there will be another one above the midrib, but this is very crucial. We're focusing now to here, below the midrib. We're focusing here now, one below the midrib, one below the midrib, one below the midrib. And that gives you a different stitching method as well. And when you focus on that, you start to realize very quickly that when you start stitching them up you end up with a pattern that that has scales that slide past each other so that the row above it slides past the row below it and so forth and so forth 
Now let's have a look at the Assyrian uh, bodice that I created, the Assyrian armor bodice that I created, and we'll go from there. Here is the bodice that I have made out of ancient Assyrian scales that were found from the ancient city of Kalhu, a modern day archaeological site of Nimrod in Iraq. As you can see, I was uh, able to stitch this without having a leather backing. So technically this would qualify as level R2. You see that there is the skirt which is attached to the bottom row of the scales and that skirt goes around and this is the side that has the curve, curved fringe on it and the right hand side and this is the left hand side that has the straight the straight cut fringe and this overlaps onto the left hand side now you might be wondering why there is a split in the middle because in ancient Assyrian reliefs specifically we don't see in Sennacherib's in Sennacherib's reliefs splits down the middle like I have here so why have I done that? you need some place to, to have a seam in order for you to be able to put it on I could have copied the side seam the side seam would make it mimic uh, a liner thorax but here in this case I've decided to do it in the center because we do see scale coats, especially the ones that are up to the knees and sometimes even up to the ankles with splits down the center. So I think it's much more likely that they would have had a split down the center because it also helps with the leatherette that goes around because that's dead center in line with, with the edge of your armor. When I do this up nice and tight, I can overlap it, or if I want to wear it loose, I can butt them up together. Here you can see the, the artic articulation the armor has, so the movement that the armor has. I wore this for approximately 12 hours from 10 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night and broke my armor in and I was sweating all the way through. This tunic was totally soaked. My undergarments under the tunic as well were totally soaked. And if you look closely, you can even see that some of, some of the red has even bled from the inside to, to the outside stitching. This pattern mimics exactly what we see on the reliefs of the Assyrian king Sennacherib. And here too, I can show you how the armor articulates. This is concertina. This is the way Assyrian armor worked. Now, I'll give it a go and show you guys what it looks like with it on. Alright, so let's give it a go. I've taken off my narrow belt and my sword strap. You can still see my broad belt is being worn. And here I'm going to give it a go trying to wear it.
These two bows have been made uh, 15 hands. We know the, the bow in ancient Assyria was a weapon that was specially associated with the goddess Ishtar. And here, again, you could see that numerology come into play. So that the actual bow, when it's unstrung, and when I first made it, was 15 hands long. Uh, and that gives you, when strung, uh, something very, very similar in size to what we see in uh, ancient Assyrian reliefs. Whether it be from the time period of the king... Ashur Nasapal II and all the way through to the reliefs of King Ashur Banipal. Now I want you guys to get a look of what I've done with the with the Nox. This particular knock as you can see the the string how should we with so 
this particular knock on this era I've done in the style of Ashurbanipal however on his bow you see lion's heads here I think you can see the opportunity uh, where a lion's head would go a snarling lion uh, ramp with with the string tucked under so I don't know if you guys can get a glimpse of that but it tucks under the the scroll and goes around the sides here and here and there's a little channel that's been created for the string to actually sit in there and then it goes it goes down the back and likewise the other ones I have also tried the duck build uh, and they work just fine uh, and the system of stringing pretty much ends up being something very similar to this however if you can imagine the the duck bill part so that when you put the string on this string would go under the actual flap of the duck bill in here and then around again likewise and string pretty much the same way and these ones are another type of uh, bow end and here you can see it's kind of like a raised a raised end onto onto which the the string will get knocked onto and this allows me to place my bow on the floor without without interfering with the with the string at all and these ones I based off two two types of uh, bows both from Assyrian uh, Ashur Nasapal's reliefs they seem to have a bow end that's something very similar to, to this and lo and behold you also find something very similar in the finds of bows from Tutankhamun's uh, tomb as well so Ashur Nasapal you're talking about 800 and say 860s BC and uh, Tutankhamun's time you're talking about uh, approximately 1300 BC so they were still using very similar types of knocks it's not until uh, Tiglath I'd say Tiglath Pilazo, King Tiglath Pilazo the third time possibly uh, from Sargon, yeah from Sargon's times definitely we see the the duck the duck bill ends uh, with knocks that are more similar to, to this this method here so although this arrow has no fletching you can you can see I've made the a tip that's to scale of Assyrian arrows this one is not trilobe there were trilobe arrows uh, uh, tips for for arrows and even with uh, hooks however this particular style is more of a, a leaf shaped or uh, and that's approximately a hand a hand long so from here all the way to to the end is actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten hands in total. So the arrow is ten hands, symbolic as well, for two reasons. Marduk seems to seems to also have been associated with the arrow and it was also uh, the god Ninurta who was associated with the arrow and uh, here I'll give you an idea of what that looks like when knocked let's see 
which way. That's heroic overdraw. Now I'm just uh, worried they might slip out of my hands and go. So let's see. Yeah, probably. So now we've got the heroic overdraw well past my ears. If you guys got a glimpse of that, let's drop back a bit and try that again. That's your heroic overdraw. Now, this, the poundage of this bow is heavier than, than this one, and both are made out of uh, PVC pipe but I put timber ends that I've carved out uh, into, into the ends of the PVC pipe and that's how I'm able to get these knocks in a much more uh, traditional manner and for, for us here in uh, Sydney or at least for me anyway I still haven't found the right connections to be able to get uh, horn and sinew to give some traditional bow making a go and recreate some Assyrian recurved bows uh, to, to scale. So I'll put this heavier, heavier one down and here again oh, let's Give that a go. So you can tell this one so much lighter. The effort I need in order in order for me to to draw that back into into a heroic overdraw it is nowhere near nowhere near as uh, and one more thing I'd like to say is most of the the time that I spent inside, up inside the chariot, taking photos with my fellow Assyrians and others who were not of Assyrian descent at the Assyrian New Year's festival. Most of my poses were with this kit, as well as a helmet, posing with bow and arrow from my uh, chariot. So let's see what that looks like from this side. Yeah, you can get a you can get a sense. That's what the the armor seems to look like whenever you you see it in the ancient Assyrian reliefs. It's almost seems like they seem to be drawing the back in shorthand. So that's from the front. much of my much of my armor from from the front and I've got my spears down downstairs in the garage because I had to get everything out of the car when we came back from the festival and I still haven't brought them up so here this is a shield from the sculptures of Sennacherib as well so here you get the full ancient Assyrian infantryman uh, kit with his big, big round shield and the body armor to match. And in this case, I've got my, I've got my speed. Poles a bit long, so 
Let's see what we can do with this. Maybe, maybe if we do it from this way, probably. That's that. Alright. What else do you want to see? I mean, give a go. I've given the axe a go. How to go with the sword. Spear and shield. Showed you some buzz. Let's see how this shield looks like. So, again. If I was to be using be using my spear, so the overhand position, underarm position. There's no there's no problems with the armor. Let's see Down here, overhand. The shields will work out, I can tell you that much. Hey. Okay, so now if we're going to go on to helmets, this was the helmet that I wore. Uh, you can you can see in there. All I've got is just a a felt band, pretty much around the ear pieces that I've stitched around, and just a simple two simple cross straps uh, to support my head inside. And you can see in these helmets, especially the ones with the ear flaps, the head tends to sit relatively deep inside the, the helmet. Uh, and I don't know if you can see that, but let's try. But I've managed to, to etch in some and the Syrian an Assyrian uh, eagle with the Shamash or cross, Maltese cross on the on the inside. Uh, so let's see if we can catch that in the in the light. Possibly, maybe not. So this I managed to rotocast out of a mold that I made of my original, and a silica mold was made. A two-part silica mold on which then a hard shell was formed. Uh, so, so this one's out of resin. You can you can see, and I've rotocasted the mold, the the resin in the mold to produce this helmet. And this. This here is another one of my helmets that I've uh, managed to to make a cast. So a two-part silica mold was made of my original one. This too is a roto casting. You can see the lining is a felt lining, uh, and I'm tending to uh, enjoy the felt lining more because it absorbs the the sweat from the brow really well, and it stops the drops forming. Uh, above the brow ridge and falling sweat falling into your eyes so uh, I think felt could possibly have been uh, 
a decent a decent alternative instead of uh, a lining out of out of leather and possibly even something more out of uh, layers of linen or layers of uh, cloth uh, material fabric uh, I think would have absorbed the sweat from the hair and the brows a lot more because it does get very hot especially when you're in them for 12 hours uh, and these obviously got battered because of the amount of amount of people that were wearing them to take to take photos in the chariot and uh, we yeah but I mean it's good now that I've got my rotor casting mold I can I can make a lot more of these uh, helmets and they'll come out the same and the, the simplistic design of the lining inside is uh, enough for you to be able to wear it uh, nice so you're not your head's not up against the, the resin and the plastic so so that's the uh, light infantryman light infantryman the spearman uh, tended to tended to have frills and this particular one is based shape wise of uh, Ashu, King Ashu Banipal's reliefs and uh, I added these extra extra lines uh, to, to signify the rank of the, the wearer so because of these fancy fancy line decorations he is more of a, a sergeant within his uh, within his crew so captain of his crew instead of just a plain a plain version with no lines which uh, to me would have signified uh, uh, private so that's that helmet too here is here is another one of my helmets this one was out of fiberglass and to be honest for uh, durability sake these fiberglass ones are a lot more uh, durable and they tend to be a lot more hard wearing when they're getting knocked around uh, by by children all day by uh, you know just the wind blowing them off the table sometimes they would fall down so these ones are really durable and I put a felt lining in here but in this one the felt lining is almost like something you see from uh, medieval uh, medieval linings in a sense uh, in that it's uh, four four triangles inside that are then attached together up at the top and I've just stitched on the 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 E flap parts uh, to to that lining as well to complete to complete the picture and instead of hinges you still have quite a bit of flex so if your heads if your heads, uh, if your ears stick out too much, it's easy. The ears tend to tend to sit above above the actual uh, line of the helmet, so further up inside the helmet. Here is here is another one I'd like to show you guys, and I was looking online I was looking online uh, to see if there's anything new out there uh, regarding Assyrian, Assyrian helmets and m what I'm starting to see pictures of uh, uh, helmets that are in private collections and I, I took most of them down I had a go at actually forming one out of, out of uh, aluminium so sheet, sheet metal aluminium uh, I have no metal metal work experience whatsoever and I was uh, capable of pulling off something something like this now in those reliefs when you sorry in those images of the actual helmets themselves you you see staples used I don't know if you can get a glimpse of the staples here you see staples used in order to to join the the seam of the helmet here together so i've had to figure out the actual 
uh, layout, like the uh, template for what they were using, and it literally is uh, a, a spherical, an arc of a circle uh, that that is forming this cone shape, and then is beaten is beaten from from the inside, obviously before you seam it up, uh, hammered and shrunk in a in a dish, and I hammered and hammered and hammered to get that uh, to get that raised effect. Uh, all the way around the the helmet and in this case the lining I've done is that uh, same as my my leather skirt here uh, so that leatherette I've used as the lining on the inside and you even see the the holes around the rim in this case I've done it tri so only three only three triangles on the inside uh, and then stitched at the at the top and then covered, covered also. If you can see, it, it it covers over around the edge of the helmet, and is a very hel comfortable helmet to wear. You also see holes on the on the side. Uh, I don't know if you can get a glimpse of what it is, but you can see the aluminium on the inside. And here I've spray painted it uh, coppery, uh, coppery color, and then just keep given it an antiquated finish so uh, surprisingly I was with very little metal metalwork experience capable of pulling off uh, uh, that that design and it's all in the actual template uh, that you cut from the from the sheet metal which allows you then to to just dish out dish out this to create that that curve and it also hardens hardens the metal up quite considerably uh, and and yeah I'll let, let's see what these look like on I've got my headband on but yeah I think I better take my headband off these particular designs actually I think resemble Ashurbanipal's reliefs of his uh, of his offices especially the the plain ones I mean you can, you can see what what it looks like here uh, that gives you that gives you an idea let's okay like that maybe maybe side view that's probably that's probably better you can get an idea of what it looks like in, in in the side profile which is what you see in the reliefs and that gives you an idea of what they look like from the front and these you can do very close up comparisons to the actual photos from those auctions where they sell these uh, in in the private collectors uh, auctions so yeah that's my first ancient Assyrian metal helmet I've, I've made as well Maybe one day I'll show people the template, but now at least we know that if anyone wants to give some serious iron work a go, uh, it's worth it because if they can construct these pieces, these uh, scale pieces, I know how to stitch them up. So if they can make them, I can stitch them up and also if they can create a flat sheet of uh, iron as well. I know the template to cut it out to then work it so that uh, we can get we can get this shape as well with a simple seam down the back instead of having to uh, raise it all out of uh, one uh, one piece from from the center, working working your way out, which is also another method that ancient Assyrian helmets used. And there is also another method. Uh, from the archaeological evidence that shows that they were made in two halves so one half and with the split running down down the front and the back and then likewise and they're uh, soldered soldered together so you get three methods of construction for ancient Assyrian helmets and here I think is one that is a very, a very simple, a very simple design with one seam, 
uh, whether it's I did the seam to be at the back because I want the seam at the back so this is my front but I think uh, an argument could be made for this actual seam where the overlap is is actually at the front of the helmet uh, however I don't like I don't like that I like that smooth finish so I've done it here at the at the front with the with the staples at the back and that's another ancient Assyrian helmet to my collection and more can come that are made out of metal surprisingly it didn't take too long and it was cold it was cold hammered as well so of course it's aluminium it would be a lot easier to work um, but with someone with no metal experience to be honest I was doubting whether or not uh, I'd be able to do it so what do you need is you need a slight a slight dish in your in your timber uh, that you're hammering the metal into just a slight dish is more than enough you don't want anything too deep uh, that's ample to give you to give you enough of a curve that you need that you see yet still maintain that that conical shape up at the up at the top all the way around which is what you see in the pictures from the helmets from uh, the Assyrian helmets from the auctioneers uh, in private collections so there we go we've got that I've been a busy little bee with my helmets making those molds was not easy to be able to then write a cast uh, copies from uh, which were copies of the foam ones that I had originally done. So for example, here so for example here you can you can see this one's being constructed out of foam floor mats and it's in segments. And those segments are a specific shape which at the bottom end up becoming the same circumference as what I need. Uh, so all you have to do really is expand, expand the template. If you're going to use eight pieces for example, eight of those uh, shapes, it's a particular shape that you need to create uh, in order to get that tip and an inside curve and then an outside curve so it's not that complicated really but you just need you just need uh, a little bit of skill with a blade and outdoor setting to to use the uh, cement the contact cement to stick the pieces together uh, and you're you're done. These are very simple. But this is what I used as, for example, my base. I've uh, I put a rim at, at the bottom, glued it down to a to a base, which allowed me then to start creating one half of the silicon mold, and then the other half of the silicon mold, and then the hard shell on one side, and then the hard shell on the other side, and then after that pull it apart, put it back together, mix a bit of resin, put it into the mold and then rotocast, rotocast the whole thing to be able to produce the, the resin copies as well. So, not bad.